Good morning, everyone, and happy Friday to you all. Um, can everyone hear me? Thumbs up? Yes. Yes. Perfect. Thank you. My name is Jackie Bungart Bibb, and I am the director of Michigan Works Southwest. I would like you to, uh, I'd like to welcome you today to the panel discussion regarding the impact of the COVID-19 uh, pandemic on Michigan's youth. The panel discussion is being recorded and will be made available for those who are not able to attend today. Uh, before we begin our discussion, I'd like to introduce our panel members. First, we have Krista Johnson. Krista is a state division administrator for the Michigan Department of Labor and Economic Opportunity Workforce Development. In this role, Krista leads the Talent Development Division and oversees a variety of federal and state employment training and education programs. Krista has served as, served as the State Division Administrator for the Talent Development Division since July of 2019. Welcome, Krista. We also have Mike Larson. Mike is the President and CEO for the Michigan Association of United Ways. Prior to joining the Michigan Association of United Ways, Mike served as the President and CEO of the United Way of the Battle Creek and Kalamazoo region. He served as the president and CPO at United Way of Greater Battle Creek from 1999 to 2008. Prior to coming to United Way of Greater Battle Creek, Mike was employed as the executive director of Livingston County United Way and the vice president of the United Way of Madison County. Welcome, Mike. We also have Kristen Lewis. Kristen is the director of Measure of America. Before founding Measure of America with former United Nations colleague Sarah Bird Sharps in 2007, Kristen was senior policy advisor to the Water and Sanitation Task Force of the United Nations Millennium Project. She previously worked at the United Nations for many years. She has served as a consultant on gender equality, development indicators, and water governance for many international development organizations. Welcome, Kristen. Thank you. And we have Renee Topolsky. Renee is the Deputy Director of School Community Health Alliance of Michigan. In this role, Renee works with state legislators and Congress to affect good policy regarding the mental and physical health of Michigan students. Welcome, Renee. So the COVID-19 pandemic continues to pose countless health, educational, and economic challenges for youth. The events of 2020 deprived young people of a host of experiences that would have allowed them to build the capabilities required to live flourishing lives as adults. Additionally, the burden of the COVID-19 pandemic has fallen disproportionately on low-income communities of color, which are also disproportionately home to the highest rates of youth disconnection. Today, we hope to bring you an informative and spirited discussion on this topic. So let's start today with a couple of questions for Kristen Lewis, Director of Measure of America. Kristen, Measure of America recently put out a report entitled A Disrupted Year, How the Arrival of COVID-19 Affected Youth Disconnection. What is youth disconnection and why is it so important? Sure, um, you can hear me, right? Yes. Okay, great. Um, so disconnected youth, um, are teenagers and young adults between the ages of 16 and 24 who are neither working nor in school. Um, the term opportunity youth is also sometimes used to refer to them. Um, so why is this important? Why does this indicator matter? Uh, the youth disconnection rate is a vital metric of access to opportunity and societal well-being. So, you know, people really acquire skills, credentials, habits and experiences that are fundamental to a rewarding, productive and joyous life during their teens and early 20s. So the youth disconnection rate tells us then which young people in our society have the chance to lay the groundwork for a freely chosen flourishing life and which groups um, face serious challenges in their transition to adulthood. Um, research shows that being out of school and out of work as a young person has long-term consequences. So it's associated with lower earnings, less education, worse health, and even um, less happiness 
in later adulthood. So it's really, really critical that we um, that we address this um, early, as soon as possible, basically. Thank you. And your report is a deep dive into the impact of the pandemic on youth and how it has further disconnected them from school and work. What are your recommendations for addressing this, is, this issue on a national level? Sure. So we have two kind of main, main things we're recommending. One is to direct resources to areas with the highest rates of youth disconnection. So we always calculate the youth disconnection rate by state and congressional district, as well as by PUMA, which is, stands for Public Use Microdata Area. That's a geography defined by the Census Bureau of about 100,000 people. And there are over you know, 3,000 of those in the country. So um, on our website, we have the rates by Puma and there are places that have youth disconnection rates, you know, well upwards of 20%. So directing resources to those areas is critical. Um, and in the short term, we really can't let the young people who fell through the cracks over the last two years use the, lose their chance um, at an education. You know, COVID-19, disrupted the educational trajectories of millions of young people. So, you know, hundreds of thousands of teens and young adults who did everything right, they were enrolled in or ready to start or on track to apply to degrees and certificate programs, training programs, really found uh, the rug pulled out from under them. And there's a really re very real danger that many of these young people, especially first generation and low income students, will really struggle to reconstruct and resume their plans if they're able to do it at all. So post-secondary educational institutions really have to be as creative and flexible as possible with a view to bringing uh, students back. You know, they have to let previously accepted students get, have another chance to start, adjust entrance requirements, and really strengthen those bridges between high school and post-secondary education uh, for vulnerable young people. You know, a uh, basically a generation of young people is, is kind of at risk of being permanently scarred by the lost educational opportunities of the last uh, two years. So we really have to work hard to avert that tragedy. Our research shows that the longer someone is disconnected, um, you know, it makes sense, the longer someone's disconnected, the, the worse the effects are um, in the rest of their life. Thank you, certainly important recommendations. Uh, let's talk next with Krista Johnson. Krista is, again, the State Division Administrator for Michigan Department of Labor and Economic Opportunity Workforce Development. Krista, with regard to youth employment, the Measure of American Re Youth Discussion Report found that a striking 3.7 million fewer youth were employed in July 2020 than in July 2019. Governor Whitmer recently announced young professionals grants that were awarded to Michigan Works agencies across the state. Can you tell us more about those grants and why they are so important? Sure, absolutely. Thanks for that question, Jackie. So one of the biggest takeaways we have from years of experience with youth focused programming is that we need to meet youth where they are, not where we assume they are or where we expect them to be. We have many youth who have never been introduced to the world of work. So it's imperative that we recognize the need to equip them with the resources, supportive services, and preparation that they need to be successful. This is exactly why LEO, our Department of Labor and Economic Opportunity, has doubled its previous investment to provide $4 million this year to support the statewide Young Professionals Initiative. The Young Professionals Initiative provides a framework that encourages local areas um, to create service delivery models that really best suit the needs of the youth that they are serving. And the initiative provides career preparation, exploration, and placement for young persons ages 14 to 24, depending upon where they are in their career journey. We've seen some amazing ingenuity from our local Michigan Works partners especially when they were pivoting to largely virtual services during the pandemic. And we certainly look forward to continuing, continued success in connecting and reconnecting young persons to the workforce. Uh, and we certainly appreciate this initiative um, as we continue our youth programs in the Southwest area. Um, so thank you for that. 
Please tell us about any other important LEO initiatives that assist youth in Michigan. Yep, absolutely. So we have a lot going on. Um, LEO provides Workforce Innovation and Opportunity Act youth funding annually to each of the 16 Michigan Works agencies to remove barriers to success in the labor market for young persons ages 14 to 24. Services range from basic resume assistance and tutoring all the way to engagement in pre-apprenticeship, work experience, and training programs. And this program has a focus on serving young persons who have disconnected from education and prioritizes engagement with work experiences. LEO has established a framework for the local Mission Works agencies to coordinate talent tours at local businesses um, that introduce young youth, parents, and educators to available career paths in their region by offering a look really behind the scenes um, into high demand businesses and industries. These opportunities help young persons connect both work and learning through engagement with employers and through hands-on experiences. Talent tours provide real-time information regarding employer education and training requirements necessary to secure employment. And really this impacts uh, of these tours include relationship building, establishing a talent pipeline for employers, talent retention, and the opportunity for uh, young individuals to really see the real life application of their coursework. And we've had over 7,000 um, young persons that have participated in talent tours. On a larger scale, LEO provides an annual award to each of the Michigan Works agencies to host or participate in career exploration and experience events. Um, these feature multiple businesses and industries at a single coordinated location instead of having individual on-site efforts at single facilities. And over 25,000 young persons have participated in these career exploration and experience events. Um, the department has supported the Jobs for Michigan's Graduates program for over 10 years now um, to engage in dropout prevention and re-engagement efforts. The JMG program equips youth with the skills to overcome their barriers and win in not only education, but employment and as citizens. As the state affiliate of the National Jobs for America's Graduates Organization, um, the, this pro programming has over 40 years of demonstrated outcomes in ensuring our country's most at-risk youth graduate from high school, enter post-secondary education, and transition into meaningful employment. Uh, we have JMG specialists across the state that um, deliver engaging and outcomes-based services to youth, giving them a reason to return, to stay in or return to school. And JMG has proven to be a strong complement to the WIOA youth programming that I mentioned a minute ago, really providing a service delivery model that drives positive outcomes for Michigan's most in need youth. I also wanted to mention that we have the Michigan Youth Apprenticeship Readiness Network, or MyYarn, um, as we call it for short, which is an initiative that will help expand registered apprenticeship opportunities for youth throughout our state. And engaging young people in registered apprenticeships is really an area of opportunity for Michigan. Youth registered apprenticeship currently accounts for less than 1% of active registered apprenticeships in our state. And MyYarn is projected to add more than 1,000 youth reg registered apprenticeships across Michigan. And more than 100 of those will be for youth with disabilities. And so finally, I wanted to say a few um, words about our vocational rehabilitation partners as well um, within the department, because they provide a variety of programming options for youth with disabilities. And some of those include um, the Department of Natural Resources and Michigan Rehabilitation Services Summer Program. Um, this is a program that really provides work-based learning opportunities and supports at DNR sites statewide for students with disabilities. Um, we also have Project Search. Michigan has approximately 20 Project Search sites jointly developed by Michigan Rehabilitation Services, Education, and Business. Um, this is a one-year employment preparation program that takes place entirely at the workplace and provides a combination of classroom instruction, career exploration, and hands-on training through worksite rotations. The program culminates in individualized job development and competitive integrated employment. 
the post-secondary education rehabilitation and transition program or the PERT program that provides a one week comprehensive vocational and independent living assessment. It's offered as a summer program at the Michigan Career and Technical Institute for students with disabilities who are in secondary education. The summer college experience program for students with disabilities, that's a partnership with Western Michigan University and it's really designed as an exploratory introduction to post-secondary education. The program components include classroom instruction, extracurricular activities, um, to establish the skills that are essential to transitioning from secondary to post-secondary education or employment. And finally, I would mention the Adjudicated Youth Project. This is a partnership with the Michigan Department of Health and Human Services, Children's Services Agency. And this project aims to lower recidivism rates, provide workplace readiness training, and increase employment outcomes for adjudicated youth who are returning to the community. So I know that's probably a lot to take in, but as you can understand, we have, have a lot of different options and things going on within the department that are targeted to our youth population. Such great information. I'm happy to hear about all those opportunities for you. So thank you, Krista. Um, now let's turn to Renee Topolsky, Deputy Director of the School Community Health Alliance of Michigan. Renee, the School Community Health Alliance of Michigan is dedicated to maintaining and expanding access to health care and mental health services for school aged children in Michigan. Why are school based health centers important and how are they helping youth with the impact of the of the pandemic. Sure. Um, well, first, I don't know how familiar everybody is with school based health centers. So I'll just provide a really brief overview and then kind of get into um, a little bit more detailed information. So um, school based health centers are basically like having a doctor's office right in um, or near school grounds. And so our centers provide both primary care and mental health care services to students. Um, they are ran by fiduciary agencies. So um, in Michigan, they're pretty evenly split between federally qualified health centers, local health departments, and local hospital systems. So it's that fiduciary in schools providing the physical health services and the mental health services to students. Um, and so it's really nice because parents don't have to take off of work. Um, students don't have to miss much class. They can literally, if they're sitting in class and all of a sudden they don't feel well, they can excuse themselves, go down to the center, um, you know, get whatever treatment that's needed. And then, you know, in most cases head right back to class. Um, so, you know, they, they are seen, students are seen regardless of um, insurance. So whether they have private insurance, whether they're, um, they are on Medicaid or they have no insurance whatsoever, um, they will be seen by the centers. Uh, parental consent is on file. And so um, that is given prior to the school year in most cases. Um, and so students have access to the center usually from day one. Um, they do, uh, the, on the primary care side of things, they do everything from, you know, sports physicals to immunizations, well child checks. Um, those services are provided by a mid-level practitioner in most cases, so a nurse practitioner, physician's assistant, or physician. Um, and then on the mental health side of things, um, it's a master's level behavioral health professional. So, um, you know, during COVID, uh, you know, obviously schools shut down immediately. So at first, most of our centers, some of our centers stayed open through the entire pandemic. Um, it really was a school to school decision because the school administrators, obviously with it being in school and on school property, the school administrators have um, say whether or not that the, the, the uh, center remained open. So some of the centers remained open entirely uh, through the pandemic. Others had to close for a week or so while everything was sort of sorted out. A lot of them moved to um, telehealth services. So, uh, but, you know, with some of our larger fiduciary agencies like, you know, Ascension Health, Henry Ford, um, you know, Beaumont, uh, they had a physical site opened uh, through the entire pandemic and kids from all school districts, even if their particular center was closed, they were able to go to that one location if they needed to, um, to see in person, uh, you know, either for primary care services or mental health. So, um, you know, a lot of our fiduciaries were sort of the first responders to the COVID pandemic. Um, you know, since COVID, 
for the past two years and everything since um, you know the vaccines have become available, a lot of our centers have become um, vaccine clinic sites so people can go and, and get their vaccines there. Um, so really, this, they really tried to stay open and support the students during a time where, you know, everybody was home, everybody was trying to work remotely, sort of figure out what the new normal was, um, and really continue to provide the services uh, to the students that were, were needed. Our centers see kids ages 5 to 21, um, so that makes it kind of nice because once they uh, graduate, students still have a couple of years to transition. Uh, and because the fiduciaries are part of a larger health entity, they're able to help them, uh, you know, transition over from the health center into the larger fiduciary to continue their, their health care services. Thank you. Now, there are currently 124 centers and schools across the state with one in nearly half of the state's 83 counties. What needs to happen to get centers in the other half of the state's counties? Sure. So, you know, we have a, a long-term plan of Shami's is to have a school-based health center um, in every school district, not necessarily every school building, but have a full clinical uh, school-based health center in every school district, and then have mental health and school nurses in every building that kind of feed into that main um, hub site. And so, you know, we know that that's really expensive and that that would take a lot of funding. So sort of a first step to getting towards that long-term goal um, is to have a school-based health center in every county. And so we have really been working with uh, the legislature to uh, try to increase funding to school-based health centers. We have funding in the um, school aid budget. And so our current line item there is $8 million. We do draw down federal funding on 6 million of that. So we get between 12 and 15 million in federal funding on that 8 million to help fund our whole network. Uh, and so we are currently in a campaign, um, 25 million more dollars for 100 new centers. And so obviously that goes above and beyond the, the counties that we would need to be in. Um, and so uh, the legislature has been receptive to, you know, our, our um, you know, our talking with them and everything. Yesterday, actually, Senator Schmidt released his school aid budget on the Senate side and included 15 million uh, more for school-based health centers in our line item. So that would open another 60 of our full clinical sites. So priority be, being given to those counties that currently don't have a school-based health center. So, you know, we know it's step one in a very lengthy budget process. Uh, and we know the house is supposed to release its budget next week. So we'll see kind of where we fall with them. Uh, but we're really hoping that if we can get at least that 15 million, then we would be able to get a full clinical site within each one of uh, the counties where we currently don't have services. Well, wow, what a great service. I, I certainly hope we can move forward and get them everywhere. That's awesome to Thank hear. You. So now let's turn to Mike Larson, president and CEO of the Michigan Association of United Ways. Mike, according to a new report from the Michigan Association of United Ways entitled 2002 Alice and Focus Children, about 1.5 million Michigan households struggle to make ends meet, which impacts nearly half of the state's children. This report went into detail about the areas where children are impacted the most. Can you talk about those areas and why they are important? Yeah. So I think just to give a little bit of background to the, uh, the, the audience on what ALICE is, um, it's an acronym that stands for Assets Limited, Income Constrained, Employed. Um, United Way, the Michigan Association of United Ways and our 40 local United Ways across the state of Michigan commissioned this report. Uh, this is uh, our, th we did three ALICE reports and uh, we just did our most recent ALICE report uh, this past year, but this is a new ALICE and focus just on children. So uh, there's a difference between our traditional ALICE report that focuses on households. This report focuses on individuals. Uh, so it's a little bit unique and a deeper dive into this, as you mentioned. And just good to understand, too, uh, like Kristen mentioned earlier, they're using the Puma data to help 
identify this, and that's the same data source that we're using uh, in this report. So I just want to recognize that. And if those who want to see more detail and dashboards, the michiganalyst.org is where I would send people. Um, this report was very eye-opening. Um, we realized that, uh, uh, as mentioned, 44%, over 946,000 children struggle uh, to make ends meet each and every day. They're in households that are struggling. And uh, we know that children below the Alice threshold often lack access to resources like stable housing, public assistance, education, broadband services, um, you know, essential services like this to thrive are critical for our children in our households. I, you know, one of the things that I found interesting in this report too is um, you would think that if you had two working parents, children's would be able to thrive. That's not the case. 23% of our children are uh, fall into this Alice category with parents both working. Uh, that's something that just, just amazes me, but it, it helps us understand the challenges of uh, what salaries uh, and hourly wages and, uh, people are making today um, and the cost to, to uh, with what every, all of us are seeing. Um, nearly 300,000 had no high-speed internet access in their own. And if you can imagine the past two years, how you know students were at working from home trying to make this work uh, and not have access to that. And even today, even back at school, much of their work happens at home. A lot of their homework happens at home. So having access to high-speed internet is, is key. 52% um, of children in renter households uh, below the Alice threshold are rent burden. That means they paid more than 35% of their household income was covering rent. So the high cost of rent uh, continues to create challenges for uh, the household, but to children specifically. Um, another point that I'd like to make was uh, also connected to uh, one of Kristen's comments. When we talk about our youth, our Alice youth in the workforce, uh, what we found is 25% um, of 16 to 17 year olds uh, were in the labor force. Of teens living below the Alice threshold, 20% were in the labor force compared to 28% of those above that threshold. So we, we saw less and less of our youth engaged in the workforce uh, during this time as well. Uh, more than 550,000 children in Michigan below the Alice threshold did not participate in SNAP. So people aren't accessing services uh, that they, they are eligible for as well. So there's just a few of the, the data points that stand out in this report. Um. So Alice households are becoming a bigger concern as the cost of living outpaces wages. What can be done to ease the burden on these households? You know, just a couple of things that I would highlight that, that United Ways are, are really focused on right now, and that would be around our earned income tax credit would be a big piece of this. Um, what we know in our Alice report, and if you look at a just a basic household budget just to survive, it has no savings account. And, and, you know, when you think about what happens in day-to-day -day life when a car breaks down and you're trying to get to work and you can't, um, you have no money in your savings to address that. Increasing um, the EITC from 6% to 30% would have a significant impact on hardworking families. And it's an incentive for people to work. It truly is. So, uh, and it benefits much more than just the family receiving the money and the children, it benefits the community as a whole. So we, we really support uh, and are pushing and driving this increase in the, in the 2023 uh, state budget. We really feel like it, it could have a significant impact. Uh, the other thing that we're, we're really focusing on is really connecting Alice families and children uh, are with child care subsidies. Um, the state made a 1.4 billion investment last year to increase 
the number of uh, child care providers and make it more, more children eligible to access it. The problem is people aren't in accessing it. And uh, we need to connect more families and enroll them in using the subsidy, subsidy and, and get more providers taking uh, uh, advantage of those payments as well. So getting more engaged um, to help those families. So those are, those are two areas that we've been focusing on. Um, I know there's a lot more, but those are areas that we really feel like will have direct impact on Alice children and households. Thank you. And uh, for the, these reports, the Alice reports are so important to guiding all of our work. So I appreciate that. Um, we now have a couple of questions for the entire panel. Um, first being, the Measure of America report found that uh, Michigan's 14th congressional district, which includes some of the lowest income neighborhoods in Detroit, is home to the country's highest youth disconnection rate at 25%. And overall, Michigan had nearly 170,000 disconnected youth in 2020. How can organizations like those on this panel work together to address this issue? I could, I could start, is that okay? Um, so just to say the, um, the uh, 14th Congressional District in Michigan has the highest youth disconnection rate of all the congressional districts in the country of the 435 congressional districts. In addition, if we are looking again at that Puma rate, the public use microdata area um, rate, we see that in parts of Flint, for instance, um, certain neighborhoods there, as many as one in five young people are out of school and out of work. And in parts of Detroit, the rate is as high as, um, as 30%. So again, you know, focusing on these areas is critically important. One thing um, we have seen um, in our work in this area is that when organizations in a state or a city, a region set collective goals in terms of reducing the youth disconnection rate, they can both um, speed progress and also really bring a lot of attention to the issue. Uh, when you have a goal, uh, it makes people pay attention, you know, tracking progress against it and so forth. Um, so just to give you an example, in 2012, we wrote our first report on youth disconnection and ranked the 25 largest metro areas in terms of their disconnection rate. And Phoenix had the highest youth disconnection rate of any major metro area in the country. Um, they were extremely shocked and embarrassed um, the superintendent of the Maricopa County Educational Services called me up, <laughs> I was driving somewhere, and said, you know, we have to do something about this. And so he spearheaded a um, collective impact exercise that brought together schools, businesses, law enforcement, municipal government, and others. And together, they had a series of meetings they worked together to set goals and then also worked together to create a plan to um, achieve those goals. So they did all kinds of things. They started a special high school for um, kids who were disconnected to come back um, that offered a variety of wraparound services. Um, and they, they just did a lot of other things and they also talked about it and reported on it. And the youth disconnection rate even now really remains a focus there and the rate in Phoenix fell more quickly over the last decade than it fell um, in, the, in the country as a whole. We also work with the San Diego workforce development folks um, over several years on a goal setting exercise. Um, and San Diego also made quicker progress than the country as a whole, particularly in terms, they had a very large um, black white youth disconnection gap and they worked to close that. You know, There are places where um, the youth disconnection rate isn't that high, um, like say Milwaukee, if you look at the city as a whole, but where the, the black rate is two, three, four times higher than the, right, than the white rate. So that again is an important target to set, not just uh, let's lower the Michigan rate from 14% to 12%, but also let's close the gaps that exist um, between racial and ethnic groups. So it really focuses the collective attention for in this case of say all of Michigan or all of uh, Detroit on, on this critical population. So that's what I would advise a goal setting exercise. And I think really building off of what Kristen was saying, 
Um, certainly developing new and expanding existing relationships. That's always been a focus of our department and partnership is vital to ensuring that not only are we leveraging available funding and services, but that we're eliminating duplication as well. So really by listening to the needs of the local area, I think we could identify where each organization can contribute and where there are gaps that other government, community, or philanthropic partners could really help with filling. So I think that's important as well. Anyone else on the panel would like to, to jump in? Good morning. I'm Lisa Byers. I'm a career coach for um, employment and training design through Michigan Works and Simca. Um, been doing this for the last three years, but my background is working with youth in transition. I started out, um, Krista, uh, as uh, I worked at Disability Network doing transition services for those youth transitioning from um, middle school to high school, high school to vocation, um, to independent living and vocational school to independent living when they go to school to their 30, but they transition out to independent living. Work with MRS. Uh, I was on the pilot program for the first project search. So that was with Blue Cross Blue Shield. Wonderful, picked out the students, was on the board, uh, transition council advisory that I was uh, belonged to during that time. It was a really wonderful program and I'm glad it's still going on. We need more programs like that identifying the youth that they selected for that program out of the several different high schools was really, um, it was exciting for me because we teach, taught them more than employability skills. We taught them more independent living skills, mobility training, how to deal with certain things. They were picked based upon their selection throughout the other organizations that were with us, that were on board. Uh, I saw them through the whole program out until when they graduated. Most of the students selected had very low self-esteem. It came from home, it came from school, and it just came from being labeled, period, throughout their lives. When they graduated through this program, because half a day they went to school, the other half they worked, they had a graduation, they received their um, degrees, and about four of them were hired into Blue Cross Blue Shield permanently. They work with the CEO all the way down to wherever, whatever capacity it was. The youth were very excited when it brought out their um, abilities to be able to communicate with people and gave them a self-esteem and learn because they had very low self-esteem. I work with them, so I saw this. Some of them are still working there to this day. And they're, they're, they're making more money. They called to check on me one day because I got laid off and just saying how I was doing, if it's something they could do for me, I thought that was very good. But within that time, I started in 2006 and stopped in 2012, 13, whatever, due to budget cuts and things of that nature and, and, and grants and all of that. Picked back up and worked at Wayne Metro in the... Um, the healthy, grow, healthy programs where we went to the after school programs. Again, now I'm with, I'm a career coach here working with youth. I love working with the youth. Very, 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 very um, personal to me because when I looked at the youth, the first thing I asked them, when I had, excuse me, I have to go back. I worked with some ninth graders doing a summer program that were transitioning to high school. 55 ninth graders trying to do a, a program with uh, um, conflict resolution. They did not know each other, but by the time our program ended for that summer, they felt more comfortable uh, transitioning to high school. My personal belief, I think we need to go back to junior high school, just my whole personal belief, seventh, eighth and ninth, because the ninth graders are not ready to entertain, to go into high school life. It's just hard for them, a lot of them. They think they want to, but it's a lot for them to grow into. When I worked with the schools doing transition services and had different workshops, um, a lot of them, it, it, of course, it came from home, where they were, what they're dealing with at home, learned behavior or where their environment is. Things that are just going on and on and on and on, continuous on. They want to get out of there. They would like to step out of there. Now, me identifying with where they were when I grew up, I grew up in a different time. I'm not going to tell you what time, but I grew up in a different time zone. Oh, I, 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 
I hate to interrupt you. I'm so sorry, but- in But I wanted to just say something. I'm sorry. I just would like to see more youth on these panels to tell us what it is they're experiencing because it's nice that we have this and we want to help, but if we can't walk in their shoes and identify with them, we're going to still be kind of in the same area. They want to have this, but we have to have them help us to see where they are. Like Krista said, meet them where they are and let them become on board with us. That's what I wanted to say. But I just Thank had you. to give you some background about, about the youth and what I've, what's been happening. And I see it all the time. And, it's, and, and we're losing our youth daily, as you can see on whether it's whatever circumstances it is, we're, we're losing and we should not be losing our youth to this. If we can change and help them, have them to help us change these laws and amend to help them. That's what I wanted to say. So thank, thank you. you. <laughs> thank you. And we appreciate that. And we'll take that feedback into consideration. Thank you so much. I do want to return to the panel. Uh, I have another question. Um, according to a recent national poll on children's health by the CS Mott Children's Hospital, 46% of parents said their teens have shown signs of a new or worsening mental health condition since the start of the pandemic. What would you like to see Michigan lawmakers do to address this issue? Well, I guess I'll start with this one. Oh, go ahead, Mike, did you? No, no, you start, okay. Renee. I'll okay, I'll be quick, I'll be quick, sorry. Um, so, you know, I think that um, we're seeing them really try to do a lot, right? And, and, and can more always happen? Sure, but, you know, if you look at the governor's exec rec, and then you look at the Senate DHHS budget and, and K-12 budget that have been released in the last couple of days, you know, I think everybody realizes that mental health, especially, you know, me mental health just in general, but mental health surrounding our students is a topic that, you know, we just, we, we have to address, we have to, you know, figure out um, how to get services to students and, and, and everything. And, you know, I, I know I've been in a ton of meetings and everything where everybody says it's great that the legislature and the governor want to invest more funding into services for kids, but we have a real practitioner shortage right now. And I, I think that's a discussion that I've really started having with legislators over the past couple months, especially. Um, and I know, I think it was Senator Vanderwall just dropped legislation a couple of days ago um, which would really incentivize mental health practitioners um, to go to school and then have a grant program in place that would pay them if they stayed in the district, um, you know, in a district within Michigan and, and began practicing here. Um, and so I think the legislature understands that it's great to put funding. And I mean, I, I, I definitely encourage them to continue to fund all of these programs and everything, but they also realize we have to have the practitioners in place in order to deliver the services. Um, and, you know, I think that they're really open to hearing discussions and hearing from the stakeholders um, and the, the, the groups who really um, are behind mental health practitioners and, and, um, and school administrators and everything. Um, so I think the conversation has been started and I think that they're beginning to sort of um, move more in, in that direction to, to make sure we have the people in place that need to be in place. I would just add just something uh, fairly simple, but I, I truly believe in, in what, what we've been saying is, um, mental health uh, disorders or challenges kids are having also has a direct link to their health, their physical health. And, uh, you know, I would encourage legislators to look at how do we integrate mental health policy more in, in connecting it to the public health policy work that we're doing across the state. Because mental health disorders truly impact health, but also it contributes to poverty and a lot of other issues that we're all seeing as well. So I think the more that we can connect those and tie those together, I think that could have uh, a real impact on our youth. Thank you for those thoughts. I do have um, one last question for the entire panel. Um, 
The passage of the American Rescue Plan Act resulted in more than 10 billion in federal aid coming to Michigan. As the state legislature and the governor consider how to use these funds, it seems that community-based services for youth should be at the top of the list. So um, just to continue with this conversation, how would you like to see these funds used in Michigan? I can kick off that one unless Mike did. Do you want to go first? No, go ahead. <laughs> All right. You know, I think um, one thing that I would say is that you know our department, in a, in a lot of instances, is working with um, federal funding. Um, a lot of our formula dollars they, that comes with a lot of restrictions. Um, I think Jackie, as you you well know, so I think certainly um, you know we see this as a potential opportunity. Um, you know, if we were able to secure some additional funding that provided us with some greater flexibility. Um, for example, um, we were talking about our Young Professionals Initiative earlier and um, the great success that it's experiencing. Um, and certainly if we were to receive American Rescue Plan funding, um, one of the things that we might be able to do is really have greater flexibility um, to reach the Alice youth that, that Mike was talking uh, about. Um, you know, really those that are over the poverty level, but, you know, maybe even under that LS rate. And we know that these, these um, families of these youth, they're financially vulnerable. And really this additional income from a young person in their household um, could really potentially help to stabilize those, those household finances. So I think that would be one idea that we would have that would really allow us um, to expand upon um, a successful initiative that we're already operating to include um, additional populations. Go ahead, Kristen. Sure. Okay. Um, I guess I have two thoughts. One is kind of a, a larger thought, which is um, that much like issues like segregation and environmental racism, uh, youth disconnection that didn't just doesn't just emerge one day uh, in a vacuum. You know, the social challenges we're struggling with in terms of um, out of school and out of work, young people um, are the result of policy, policy decisions about where to invest our public dollars made over decades. So I realize I'm completely preaching to the choir here, uh, but to shift the tide, we really have to decide to make significant policy and investment changes um, in the other direction. So this really means heavily investing in um, our young people and those people serving them, particularly in areas like Flint, Detroit, that have some of the highest youth disconnection rates in the country. So that's sort of a meta issue. Um, the second is, I think that it's really critically important to find ways to bring people back into the educational system. Um, so just for instance, among first time college goers, this is nationwide, community college attendance dropped by nearly 30% for Black, Latino, and Native American students, and by nearly 20% for Asian and white students during the pandemic. So that's a huge, a huge drop. Um, so, you know, these are our, you know, these are our, our kids who don't necessarily have a really clear pathway um, to college education if their parents didn't go to go to college. So um, this drop is really worrisome and addressing it is a critical priority. So we hear so much about making young people college ready, um, but now we really need to focus on making schools student ready, really meeting these young people where they are, giving educators the resources they need uh, to, to really meet the needs of this, this student group. And also listening, as um, I think it was Lisa who was saying, uh, listening to what young people say they need to succeed in uh, their transition from uh, their teen years to their adulthood. I guess I would just add, I, you know, we're in a very unique situation right now where we have a real influx of dollars and probably be the only time in my lifetime we ever see that kind of money uh, um, available to our state and our local communities. Um, we have obviously a lot of immediate need um, across the state for our children, but the reality is, is I hope that we continue to invest in sustainable, sustainable infrastructure that helps well beyond these initial dollars, but it, it creates the structure that allows us to support 
uh, those, those children and families that are struggling. So an example would be to me is, you know, affordable housing. How do we use some of these resources to create affordable housing uh, that protects our children uh, in those families, those Alice families as well? I'll just add really quickly too, um, you know, with the federal funding and it being one time dollars, um, you know, we've had the discussion with legislators that, you know, we want to be mindful that we don't use one-time funding to start services for students, right? Because what happens in three years when that federal funding goes away, what happens to those services? You know, um, we've done a lot of work with state dollars to um, introduce Medicaid policy, um, you know, that uh, would apply to general ed students and, and mental health services. So we draw down federal dollars to try to make programs sustainable that way. Um, but, you know, we actually surveyed our field of centers. Um, you know, what can you use one-time funding for besides, you know, hiring, opening new centers and hiring new staff and everything that may go away in three years. And, you know, things like improving telehealth, you know, um, services, you know, improving internet connections, that, that kind of thing. Um, you know, some of our rural sites have outdated internet and everything. And so it's, it's, it's things like that. So, you know, while it would be great to take hundreds of millions of dollars and invest it in services, three years down the road, you know, what happens to those, those students who are being serviced? So, you know, we just, we've had a lot of conversations with state legislators um, just to sort of be mindful if you're going to invest in services, make sure it's done in a way that it can sustain itself three years from now when that funding goes away. So um, that's all I, I had to add. Thank you. And those are all very good points. And I could not agree with you more, especially Krista, those, uh, you know, um, unrestricted funds or less restricted funds. Great ideas. Um, I do want to thank you all, all our panel members, but I also, we have a, a few minutes left. I'd like to open it up to the panel members uh, if they have any final thoughts to share with us. None other than it takes a village. It takes all of us. Every little bit helps. And you have to be passionate about what you do, have that compassion. I identifying with our youth these days, I don't think I could have grown up <laughs> during this time. I'm glad I grew up when I did, but at the same time, I'm able to give them some encouragement and empower them from where things started and how it could, how it was so that they can see, you know, they're born into this, the, these times that they're in. So for them to grow up in this, they're assuming, is this what adulthood is like? Because when I grew up, it wasn't like that. So they were looking forward to a lot of things. And yes, the pandemic did throw us all off. But I think in the same sense, we all could grow from the pandemic and just look within ourselves, examine our own selves to be able to help somebody and help our youth to come along with whatever little bit we can and encourage and empower them, just seeing them daily. The certain things that they call me for in needs is not always employment. Like uh, I think Renee said and Kristen, Kristen said, you know, it's, it's all about um, just the in, little things that they need. I mean, it could take a smile for them to think, okay, somebody does care, just a phone call just to say, how are you doing? You never know at that time what they're experiencing, where they go through. And if you don't hear from them in a while, and then they finally call and they said, I have been through so much. And I'm thinking, how old are they? Like 17. I'm like, my goodness, they have experienced more in their lifetime than I have in mine. And I'm way older than them. But I'm just saying that it's just all of our youth are going through this, experiencing what they see on a daily basis, not just within school, but in life and what they hear, period. And when they see a lot of, um, leadership and adults fighting and bickering with each other that trickles right on down to them and it's it, and for them to grow up in it and, and have some types of dream hopes and goals and desires and that's what I try to help my youth to identify what it is they are but it's, it takes a little bit at a time you can't just put it all on them but that's what I had to say I know I talk a lot but when is the next one we're coming to have <laughs> well, thank you <laughs> um panel members did you have anything before we close out today? 
guess one thing, which is that the country as a whole, Michigan included, had really been making steady and heartening progress in reducing the share of young people who are out of school and out of work. So, you know, like a million fewer young people were disconnected um, in 2019 than in, say, 20, 2010. So that was really encouraging. And, you know, the effects of COVID-19, the health, educational, and economic impacts really reversed this positive trade, uh, trend and, and really hit the groups already the most likely to experience disconnection the hardest. So particularly Native American and Black households, as well as low-income communities. And, you know, it's like pretty much like every natural or man-made disaster, uh, COVID-19 worsened inequalities that already already existed. And I think a lot of the things that we've been talking about in this panel in terms of investing in communities in a really durable and lasting way is, um, is what we need to increase the security of communities so that they aren't, you know, the, the most vulnerable, hardest hit and facing the steepest climb to recovery. Thank you. And again, I would like to thank our panel members for their time today. Thank you for sharing your knowledge, your personal stories. Um, there is something in the chat uh, about getting resources to participants of this, um, this panel or this discussion. Um, Kim, are we gonna be able to do that? Yes, so I'm going to um, save the chat and I will um, compile all of the questions and send them to our panel members. And since everybody registered for the panel, they will get a recording and then any answers that we have come back from those questions. Perfect, perfect, thank you. And I hope you all found this discussion as informative and valuable as I have today. Um, thank you again to everybody who joined us and to our panel members. And I hope you have a, a really great Friday and a great weekend. Thank you. Bye. Thanks for including me in this uh, important conversation.